All right. Well, hello and welcome to those of you who are uh, attending tonight our uh, CS webinar, uh, where we're going to talk about two really interesting cases um, uh, that have uh, that are going to be presented tonight. So, I my name is Ben Prince. I am uh, actually an assistant professor of pediatrics over at Nationwide Children's Hospital, uh, and I'm going to be the moderator for the first case. Um, our first case uh, is going to be. Uh, our junior presenter is going to be uh, Basil Kawash, and our senior presenter is going to be Roshni Abraham. Uh, Dr. Kawash uh, uh, actually received his undergraduate training in, uh, at Kenyon College and his medical degree at University of College of Medicine. Uh, he then went on to do his residency in internal medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine before coming here to Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, and the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, where I know him quite well. Um, he is a first year allergy immunology fellow. Uh, and like I said, I had the pleasure of working with him on a day to day basis. Um, Dr. Abraham, uh, we should all know very, very well. She is our uh, immediate past president of CIS. Uh, she is actually uh, currently a professor of clinical pathology at the Ohio State University and uh, associate chief of academic affairs and founding director of the Diagnostic Immunology Laboratory in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, we all know her to be extremely influential in the field and she's contributed both uh, from a diagnostic immunology standpoint as well as from a publication standpoint where she's had over 200 peer reviewed journal, journal articles, reviews, book chapters, et cetera. So with that, I will turn things over uh, to Dr. Kawash, uh, who is going to present our first case on uh, febrile neutropenia, lymphopenia, and failure to thrive in a previously healthy nine month old male. And one last thing to say before I uh, give things to Dr. Kawash is don't forget if you have questions, uh, feel free to um, go ahead and post them in the chat area. And uh, once the presentation is over, um, I can address them to our speakers. Thanks again, Dr. Kawash. Thanks, Ben, and thank you all for allowing me to come and speak to you tonight. I'm really excited to present this case. Can everybody hear me okay? Or can some of you hear me? I think you are good. All right, awesome. <laughs> Great, okay. Here come the messages, awesome, awesome. All right, so let's get started with presenting this case. So, I saw this was a few months ago in the hospital, um, an inpatient, a nine-month-old boy, no past medical history initially, was healthy up through several months of age, and he was initially admitted to the hospital for failure to thrive. Actually, his parents had brought him into his primary care physician who noticed that his growth curve had trended down from around the 15th percentile to very, very concerning, uh, less than the first percentile. And this happened over the course of about two weeks when he was eight and a half to nine months old. Um, the parents reported that he had a history of feeding intolerance, recurrent vomiting, and uh, the primary care pediatrician ordered a pretty extensive workup that was grossly normal with the exception of the CBC that revealed neutropenia. He had an absolute neutrophil count of 860 and uh, lymphopenia with an absolute lymphocyte uh, count of 214. Uh, so he was admitted to the hospital for just around two days at that time. Uh, they um, switched his formula and his growth curve, his failure to thrive did seem to improve somewhat. Um, and he remained neutropenic uh, because his, he had improved slightly. The parents felt comfortable taking him home, but he was given, uh, his parents were given strict instructions to bring him back to the hospital if he developed a fever uh, as he was still neutropenic and it appeared um, immunosuppressed. So uh, he was brought back to the hospital two days later. This, this is when he came in with the febrile neutropenia temperature of 101 Fahrenheit. Um, this is the, before that previous CBC where he was neutropenic with an ANT of 860. That was the first one that he had ever had. Uh, we don't have any previous CBC from his childhood, but. This is, I believe, the second one that was taken shortly after he was admitted to the hospital. Um, so as you can see, his white count quite low. He was anemic. Uh, his neutrophil count continued to trend down. So it went from 860 to 530 over just those few days between the two CPCs that were drawn. Uh, and he remained persistently lymphopenic. So that prompted an infectious workup. Um, the ED obtained a chest X-ray, blood cultures, respiratory vinyl, viral panel. And when those came back, it demonstrated that he did have this 
right posterior lower lobe consolidation. Ultimately, the RVP uh, PCR demonstrated a positive paranumovirus three. Yeah, Carl Yu, nice job, close. Paranumo, not quite parainfluenza. So that um, the fact that he had now come in with this viral pneumonia, failure to thrive, poor intake, and his ANC was not improving, he remained persistently lymphopenic. He did have also some relative eosinophilia. All of that combined led to some concern for a primary immune deficiency uh, versus some sort of a bone marrow failure disorder as to why he was not producing adequate quantities of white cells. Um, Notably, though, his Trek-based newborn screen at birth was normal. I don't have the exact CQ number with me right now, but the report said that his risk level was low. It wasn't borderline. It was uh, quite firmly that he had a normal Trek-based newborn screen. Uh, initially, the team obtained an HIV workup and sent for anti-granulocyte antibodies, and those were negative. And then our team got involved and recommended an expanded immunodeficiency workup. You can see that uh, in the interim, a bone marrow biopsy was performed due to the persistent neutropenia with, uh, like I said, worsening um, neutrophil count overall. And that was, grossly speaking, not entirely um, uh, diagnostic. So it did show a left shift in granulocytes and decreased mature granulocytes as well as hypercellular marrow. Otherwise, it didn't reveal a whole lot. Um, Serum immunoglobulins were also well, pretty much all within the normal range, and his uh, tetanus and diphtheria antibodies were normal. Um, so our next step was to perform lymphocyte subset quantitation by flow cytometry. And what that demonstrated to us was that we knew he was profoundly lymphopenic, uh, and his total T cell count was quite low, but his B cell and NK cell levels were extremely low. And this was highly unusual given that his immunoglobulins were, as we saw in the last slide, quite normal, and the fact that his Trek screen had also been normal just a few months before, well, nine months before. If you look at the top right of the screen, we also performed T cell proliferation to fight. Hmm. Um, can I advance the slide? Did somebody? Okay. Sorry about that. So the top right of the screen, we performed T cell proliferation to phytohemagglutinin, and that was somewhat diminished as well. So we're left with this um, absence of TB and NK cells, this T minus B minus NK minus phenotype, which didn't quite fit with some of the other data that we had about the patient. Uh, and just a little bit more background, he was up to date on all of his vaccines, including the live rotavirus vaccine. Um, his parents had deferred his nine month vaccinations, but uh, through six months, he was completely up to date. Um, and those were only deferred because he was admitted to the hospital and because there was some confusion around uh, why he was so ill at that point. But the profound lymphopenia here on flow cytometry suggested uh, some sort of a skid and prompted us to consider further immunological evaluation, including T cell subsets. So here on the next slide, you can see the um, flow cytometry that was done. So the CD45 RA positive, um, the naive T cell levels are quite low for his age, 11.2% relative to the RO positive. So those are near 80%, 79%. Uh, and we see that uh, of those naive T cells, the, a vast majority are true naive T cells, um, but there are fairly um, you can see also on the right side of the screen the um, central memory and effector memory levels as well. So um, if anybody wants to type or uh, share with me what your presumptive diagnosis consideration is at this point. Okay. Okay, so we have maternal engraftment, hypomorphic mutation. Um, any idea of hypomorphic mutation or hypomorphic variant in which gene?
It is a male patient, yeah, nine-month-old male. I'm sorry, Carl, you typed something, but it popped onto the screen in addition to several other things at the same time, so I didn't quite catch it. Do you mind re-entering? AK2. Carl had typed in. Carl had typed in the uh, ADA with maternal engraftment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good thought. All right. Well, if we're ready to move on to the next slide, uh, we did consider ADA in our differential diagnosis, and in fact, we sent down to Duke the um, uh, ADA activity and ADA metabolites level for uh, the specialty lab down there. Um, so ADA enzyme activity, adenosine metabolites, and as you can see, our patient's levels were rather abnormal. In fact, he had no ADA activity, uh, no erythrocyte ADA activity, I should say. Um, and his levels of adenosine metabolites, that's on the right side, you can see RBC nucleotides, particularly uh, deoxy-AXP, that's one of the metabolites of adenosine, that one, that level of that nucleotide is um, very highly elevated compared to normal. So normal should be almost undetectable and his level was a 0.241. So um, clearly demonstrated that he was ADA efficient, uh, deficient, excuse me. Um, but they did note that not quite to the degree of early onset patients with ADA skid. So that led us to consider um, his genotype, and we sent for genotyping of his ADA gene, and he was found to have a compound heterozygous mutation. So uh, the first allele was a known pathogenic variant that had been sequenced before with a total deletion of exon 1, uh, and the second was a splice site, splice site variant that was at that time classified as a variant of unknown significance. Now. Um, has been established as a pathogenic variant. So uh, clearly we had gene knockout in both alleles. So just for some pathophysiology background, partial ADA deficiency has been described in several patients. And um, those of you who had indicated that we should be considering a hypomorphic mutation are absolutely correct because um, complete ADA deficiency is kind of the classical or typical textbook ADA that ADA deficiency that presents with SCID uh, due to absence of ability to metabolize adenosine and therefore early toxicity to lymphocytes. Uh, whereas partial ADA de deficiency, you can still see some retained ADA deficiency. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, retained ADA activity, and therefore. Um, there will be some, there will be a delay in buildup of the toxic metabolites and thus a delay in dying off of the lymphocytes. So here's a table comparing features of typical ADA skid versus delayed onset ADA deficiency. Um, the delay you'll typically see this diagnosed between the ages of six to 24 months rather than uh, in the first six months of life. And in this day and age, usually this will be diagnosed with an abnormal TREC screen, but with delayed onset ADA deficiency, that's not the case um, because at that point, they still have normal expansion of T cells and the TREC levels will be normal. Uh, however, there was a paper that was published in, I believe, 2013 that demonstrated that in delayed onset ADA deficiency patients, you can make the diagnosis at birth also using tandem mass spectrometry looking for the metabolite levels, which uh, second row from the bottom, you can see that the adenosine metabolite levels will be highly elevated in ADA skid, but still moderately elevated in delayed onset ADA deficiency. Therefore, you can identify those uh, from a drop of blood at a very early age. Um, the enzyme activity, as I kind of alluded to before, is extremely low for ADA skid, so less than 1% and low but not quite as low for delayed onset ADA deficiency. So you can have this sort of hypomorphic presentation where uh, some degree of ADA activity is still retained and that's quantitated between five to 70%. That's 
the range that's been described in before. Lymphopenia itself can be mild, particularly up to a certain age. And here's a table that's taken from a, the um, management of ADA deficiency pa uh, paper that was published in Jackie just this year, uh, demonstrating what are currently seen, what we currently consider to be the two first line treatments for ADA deficiency. One is stem cell transplant and another is um, gene therapy. Uh, these are both at this time presently considered to be uh, the first treatment that you would typically go to for one of these patients. And there are benefits and disadvantages to both of them. Um, certainly uh, time to procedure is one thing to consider and uh, availability um, because only a few centers, at least a, a few months ago, were doing gene therapy and currently it's somewhat difficult to uh, to enroll somebody in, in the United States. Uh, in Europe, it has been approved. Uh, but um, one advantage of gene therapy is that you spare the risk of graft versus host disease. So going back to our patient, how did he do? Um, he did suffer some significant complications after he was diagnosed. So he was, was readmitted shortly thereafter with uh, several infectious complications. He had C. diff colitis, PJP, adenovirus, and all at separate times. Uh, he was started on Bactrim. Yeah. I saw the note about the uh, the question, and um, if you'll allow me, I was just going to um, going to finish the case summary, and then uh, yeah. Why don't well, we'll why don't you yeah go ahead and finish the case basketball, well, and then we'll 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 go on to questions. Sure. Uh, so the patient was started on prophylactic antibiotics and IVIG, and in the meantime, we looked for a definitive treatment. Um, we unfortunately were not able to identify a familial or registry-based HLA match donor for a stem cell transplant. And uh, at this time, gene therapy, it's the FDA approval timeline puts us in late 2020, early 2021. So uh, we wanted to intervene sooner than that to, um, to prevent further infectious complications in this kid. So uh, he's been receiving now this um, enzyme replacement with a recombinant pegylated ADA. And at one year of age now, he's doing uh, very well, hasn't had any febrile illnesses in the last two months, and his growth has improved quite remarkably. And so these last few slides, I'm just going to be summarizing how he's, uh, how he's improved on the RevCovi, which is that pegylated recombinant uh, ADA that he's been receiving monthly. So typically, the time course to improvement in Rebcovi can be up to six months, but he had rather dramatic improvement both in his ADA activity and, as we'll see, as we'll see on the next slide, in his lymphocyte count, clearly clinically. Um, just within the last several months of starting Rebcovi, it's been, looking at this slide, it's been two months and a day since he received his first treatment. And you can see his plasma ADA level has um, normalized well above 100, 121 at the last time and his adenosine metabolite levels have correspondingly come down. And his lymphocyte populations have also improved uh, rather remarkably. So total lymphocyte count now is well above 1,600, uh, including substantial recovery of B cells and NK cells. And his naive and memory T lymphocyte ratio has also improved um, appropriately with the treatment. both as a percentage of the T cell, total T cell count, as well as um, the total naive and memory T cell levels, as you can see in the bottom right. So that concludes the case, and now I'll open it up to any questions. Thanks, Basil, that, Thank was, uh, that was awesome. Um, I think, you know, the first question that Dr. Rosenwig uh, had asked uh, was, you know, how, you know, we, it, the first mutation of the exome 1 deletion was was a known pathogenic mutation, but um, right. did you guys go through any um, steps to prove that the second mutation um, was in fact pathogenic? Mm -hmm. 
Sure, that's a great question. I'd actually like to defer that one to Dr. Abraham, who may have uh, yeah, more to add on so, that. Right. Um, I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, Sergio, uh, the, uh, the report initially classified it as BUS because it was plus five. But after we got the ADA enzyme activity and the adenosine metabolites, uh, in BTA reclassified that as a pathogenic variant based on the clinical phenotype and the functional ADA activity, even though it's sort of a little outside what we would consider a classic splicite variant. Thanks, Dr. Abram. And I was just going to ask you, go ahead and ask you uh, if there was anything that you wanted, anything else that you wanted to point out or comment on um, uh, regarding yes. this case. Yes, thank you very much, Ben. And thank you, Basil, for the presentation. You did a great job. Um, a couple of comments that I wanted to make. Uh, one was with regard to the trek level being normal in this child. And Basil alluded to the fact that the Ohio newborn screen um, said low. And just to clarify, uh, in the Ohio newborn screen, they actually have a risk level, low risk, moderate risk, and elevated risk. So they don't actually report out a numerical value like, um, you know, track copies or CT uh, or so. And uh, I'll get back to Sergio's question in a moment. Uh, so uh, they tend to do this classification of low risk, moderate risk, and elevated risk to make it easier for the primary care pediatricians who may not understand what a CT value means. So once uh, this child was sort of diagnosed, they went back and they looked again, and their cutoff is around, uh, in terms of CT cycle threshold value, around 37 point or uh, 37.3, I don't remember, and he was at around 34. So he wasn't borderline, he was well within the uh, normal range. And uh, uh, some colleagues from Europe, um, Carsten Speckman and Kirsten Felgentreff, had reported a letter uh, in Jackie where they had a similar patient with delayed onset ADA skid who had normal trick but they did CREC analysis and showed that CREC was abnormal. And so the question is, would CREC be more informative than TREC uh, in these sort of patients who have a combined immunodeficiency? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think in the US, we don't have CREC as part of our recommended uniform screening panel. Some states have attempted to do some pilot studies, but it hasn't been approved. And we uh, are um, initiating a new guidelines document through the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, the CLSI. And one of the mandates of this document, which we will de develop later this year, is to address the issue of reporting of TREC, uh, whether the value of CREC in newborn screening, and the minimum follow-up test that should be done for an abnormal result. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, try to achieve some sort of consensus because according to some of the published data, CREC might be more useful than TREC uh, in diagnosing these sort of late on for patients. Um, going back to Sergio's question, it's a good point, Sergio. Uh, one could do the cDNA analysis just in the uh, constraints of time and resources, we didn't do it because um, I don't think the diagnosis was in doubt per se, but yes, definitely that could be done. So thank you for that. Um, I don't have any other comments at the moment, but Carl, I think, also pointed out. So Dr. Park has shown in the California newborn screening uh, that there are some ADA skid patients that can, that can be missed by newborn screening. And uh, as I mentioned, there's some European examples. So um, I think it's instructive that uh, the presence of normal immunoglobulins does not rule out the possibility of an underlying skid. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Abraham. Um, one question that I actually had, and, and um, you know, this is actually probably going to be a mute point given that this child is ultimately going to undergo 
uh, gene therapy, given that he doesn't have a, uh, a a good match at this point in time for for transplant. But um, as far as starting them on replacement therapy, enzyme replacement therapy, what is this, is the consensus for when to stop? I mean, it, it sounds like you know for gene therapy, oftentimes it's continued. Um, even after uh, gene therapy is undergone, you know, a month after. Um, I think that, you know, kind of the, the thoughts and the data on if you do do a bone marrow transplant on whether to stop it, you know, prior to doing transplant, um, especially if you're not going to do any conditioning versus continuing it. Um, so just a couple of points, Ben, with regard to that question. So as you know, um, the mother is expecting another child and the fetus was tested and found not to uh, have ADA skin, but is a carrier for the maternal variant. Um, we don't know at this point whether this in uh, this fetus um, is an HLA match for this child, uh, but we are in the process of doing HLA testing. Um, and actually, I remembered that I was supposed to discuss that with the um, immunogeneticist at OSU today, and I forgot to do that. So anyway, um, so if we do find out that that infant is a match, then potentially a cord blood transplant could be considered. Um, we are also, Lydiant is uh, doing a post-marketing um, analysis of RevCoV uh, and uh, all patients who are uh, getting RevCoV are being encouraged, you know, those centers are being encouraged to register in the trial and contribute the data. Uh, and we will also participate in that post-marketing survey. So I think it's still a bit of an open question at this point whether he'll have a transplant versus gene therapy. Um, in the European case from Germany, they had used bovine PEG uh, ADA at that time, and they found that after a few months of treatment, uh, the patient's uh, ADA enzyme activity dropped, and it coincided with production of neutralizing antibodies to ADA. And so they overcame that by increasing their dosage. And one of the questions that um, I think Lydiant is considering, and I don't know that there are any clear answers, and I'm certainly um, open to hearing that from Dr. Rosenzweig or anybody else on the call, uh, is you know the uh, frequency at which neutralizing antibodies appear to RevCoV uh, and the timing at which it appears. And I'm not aware of any data with regard to RevCoV, and I would defer to Sergio or anybody else who might know the answer. <laughs> Sergio said he does not know. <laughs> well, um, if there are no more questions at this time, we are just a little over our time, uh, our, our allotted time. So uh, again, I again want to thank um, Dr. Abraham and Dr. Kawash uh, for doing the presentation. Um, it was a really, really uh, interesting case. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you all again for a great presentation. Um, so our, I'm Elizabeth Fuel, at, and I work at Cornell. Um, and today we're going to have Daniel Groff, who's um, a pediatrician who will be going into allergy and immunology, presenting our case. Um, and Dr. Sergio Rosenzweig at the NIH is the senior mentor, providing some expertise on this for us. Um, so, um, Daniel? Okay, uh, thank you. So, so we present a six-year-old Hispanic female with chronic treatment refractory ITP, B cell precursor LL in remission, and asthma since infancy. Um, she's now presenting with bleeding symptoms of epistaxis and easy bruising. So I'm first gonna discuss her past medical history in detail before moving on to her current presentation. So starting with this patient's past medical history from infancy, so following discharge from a two-week NICU stay for labored breathing and wheezing 
after meconium aspiration, she had persistent wheezing and was ultimately diagnosed with asthma. Um, during her week workup for wheezing at three months of age, she was incidentally found to have low platelets. Platelet levels decreased to a nadir of 3,000 at one and a half years of age when she first displayed easy bruising and epistaxis. So this was associated with apparent fatigue and symptoms of viral illnesses. Following ITP diagnosis, she received IVIG and steroids for symptomatic bleeding. The first episode requiring IVIG was due to persistent epistaxis, and the second was after mild head trauma. There was a good platelet response each time, and she did not require platelet transfusions, but she did not have a sustained response to these first-line agents. Her responses lasted about a month, with platelet counts improving to 20 to 30,000. So during routine follow-up for ITP at age three, our patient was found to have peripheral blasts with flow cytometry and bone marrow biopsy confirming B-cell precursor ALL. Her le leukemic clone at the time revealed trisomy 10 and a triplication of RUNX1, which is a myeloid development transcription factor. She was treated as per non-study berlin frankfurt Munster protocol for standard risk pre-BALL. So this regimen included prednisone, and Christine, Donna Rubison, pegasparaginase, cyclophosphamide, citerabine, or mercaptopurine, and methotrexate. Following chemo, she achieved remission. Notably, her platelet counts normalized on chemotherapy to 100 to 200,000. This normalization of her platelets while on chemo was highly suggestive of an immune mediated destruction of platelets, as opposed to other possible etiologies for thrombocytopenia as chemotherapy likely suppressed the antibody-producing clone. So this brings us up to speed on our past medical history. To summarize again, we have a six-year-old female with treatment refractory ITP, B-cell ALL in remission, and asthma, again presenting with bleeding symptoms, e including easy bruising and epistaxis. At this time, labs confirmed platelets are decreased, now to a nadir of 18,000. Though it's reassuring that all other cell lines are normal, a repeat bone marrow needs to be performed to distinguish between ITP and possible leukemic relapse. <clears throat> so bone marrow evaluation reveals normal cellular bone marrow, including normal number and morphology of megakaryocytes and normal cytogenetics. This normal bone marrow exam includes um, excludes rechemic relapse and confirms ITP recurrence, demonstrating a chronic course of ITP over most of this young patient's life, retractory to multiple first-line treatments, including IVIG and steroids. For her chronic recurrent symptomatic ITP, our, our patient has started on, thrombo, on the thrombopoietin agonist, Altrombopeg. She initially does well. However, over several weeks, she develops a transaminitis. In addition to rising transaminases, our patient develops an elevated bilirubin mm -hmm. and GGT on this agent, revealing a liver dysfunction. Initially, this is thought to be due to drug-induced hepatotoxicity. Due to this possible drug effect, Altrombopeg is substituted with bromiflostin, another thrombopoietin agonist that is not associated with liver dysfunction, but LFTs remain elevated. At this point, the lack of improvement in our patient's hepatitis prompts a workup by pediatric hepatology. The differential diagnosis includes drug-induced drug idiosyncratic liver dysfunction, as mentioned already, biliary sludging, as there had been evidence of a possible sludge or stone on our patient's last sonogram, and autoimmune hepatitis, though initial markers of autoimmune hepatitis were negative. At the recommendation of hepatology, romiplostin is discontinued, and our patient has started on steroids, azathioprine, and ursodiol. Subsequently, we, we do see improvement in our liver enzymes. Although autoimmune hepatitis serology is negative, a clinical diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis is established based on response to immune modulators. Off of these agents, her hepatitis recurs, but again improves after restarting steroids. This does lend further evidence to the theory that her liver dysfunction is due to autoimmune hepatitis, 
but she has yet to undergo a liver biopsy to confirm this, given her bleeding risk due to treatment re refractory ITP. So our patients' multiple manifestations of immune dysregulation, including multiple autoimmunity and chronic ITP and autoimmune hepatitis, as well as asthma and B-cell leukemia, causes us to consider a possible underlying genetic cause. For this reason, we've, we refer her to genetics for whole exome sequencing. So whole exome sequencing is performed, and this reveals a heterozygous germline mutation in the IKZF1 gene. This is also known as the Icarus gene. Our patient's specific germline mutation is a variant at PR162W, which has been reported in three patients prior to ours. Per the performing lab, this variant is classified as likely pathogenic by in silico analysis, but the definitive in vitro testing on previous patients with this mutation demonstrates the mutation is proven pathogenic as well. So this gives our patient a diagnosis of Icarus-related dis disorder, which, which has been previously reported in, associate, in association with a subset of CVID patients, autoimmune diseases, and a predisposition, predisposition to ALL. So this disorder is known to be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion with reduced penetrance. I'll come back to review the specific disorder based on current literature after the case. For a moment, I'd like to briefly step back and more broadly overview immune deficiencies in association with autoimmunity and malignancy, as it's clear now that even in the absence of infection history, primary immune deficiency should have been in the back of our minds with this patient's presentation. So PIDs are a group of more than 300 single gene defects affecting the immune system. A 2017 paper from the Jackie used data from the French National PID Registry to determine incidence of autoimmunity and inflammation in PID. Looking at over 2,000 cases retrospectively, they found one or more autoimmune and inflammatory complications in 26% of patients, with risk of onset throughout the patient's lifetime. So looking at specific autoimmune and inflammatory complications, data from the French PID registry showed that, strikingly, the risk of autoimmune cytopenia was at least 120 times higher than in the general population. This included both anemia and thrombocytopenia. And the authors suggested that all patients with autoimmune cytopenia, like our patient, should be screened for PIDs, ideally in childhood. They recommended the same screening for patients with IBD and perhaps inflammatory arthritis, as their data showed that the risk of pediatric IBD in children with PID is 80 times higher than age-matched controls, and the risk of other autoimmune diseases is approximately 10 times higher. Also, somewhat strikingly, all types of PIDs were associated with increased risk of autoimmune and inflammatory complications, although the greatest risk was with T-cell PIDs and CVID. Additionally, authors found that the occurrence of autoimmune disease was a negative prognostic factor for survival. So just as autoimmunity is seen with a higher incidence in PID versus the general population, the same goes for malignancy. The association has been noted for many years and has been confirmed by single center studies and from data collected in established registries, but most studies are old at small numbers and had no comparison groups. A recent paper published in the Jackie used data from the US, uh, USID net to evaluate can, uh, incidence of cancer in patients with PID versus incidence in the general population for whom data was taken from the surveillance, epidemiology, and end results program database. Comparing over 3,500 PID patients from the registry to the general population, the authors found a 1.4-fold increased relative risk of cancer in PID patients. This increased incidence was driven mostly by an excess of lymphoma, which is seen at 10 times higher rates in PID. Notably, there was no, no significant increases of the most common solid tumor malignancies of, in PID versus the general populace, so those being lung, colon, breast, and prostate cancers. To touch on our patient's leukemia diagnosis, although leukemia is known to occur at higher rates in specific PIDs associated with DNA repair defects like ataxia telangiectasia, Benconi's anemia, Bloom syndrome, and Namekin breakage syndrome, this study found a similar in incidence of leukemia in registry patients versus the age adjust adjustment population. Though CBIT is not classically associated with a higher incidence of leukemias, and indeed the study found that it is not, 
We will later discuss our patient-specific subset of CVID related to Icarus mutations and its association with B-cell precursor ALL. So back to our case, because germline Icarus mutations have been associated with a subset of CVID patients, our patient is referred to, the, uh, to clinical immunology. Notably, our patient has not suffered clinical manifestations of immune deficiency with no history of recurrent, severe, or unusual infections. The immunophenotyping thus far has been limited because of repeated IVIG required for ITP, which has been given again recently to boost, to boost cows for possible liver biopsy to confirm autoimmune hepatitis. To avoid measuring passive immu immunity, we'll be waiting at least 12 weeks after last IVIG uh, before obtaining an accurate IgG level. Additionally, vaccine responses have been difficult to check as these may have been lost during chemotherapy. So far, our workup has revealed normal total T and B cell counts, but decreased NK cells and decreased naive T cells. B cell phenotyping reveals normal B cell subsets, except decreased transitional B cells and plasma blasts, which has been associated with hypogamma globulinemia in some patients. Quantitative immunoglobulins has shown low baseline IgM, which is undetectable most recently. Again, IgG has been difficult to measure accurately. Lymphocyte prolifera proliferation to antigens and mitogens is also normal, um, and more detailed immune testing is pending. So because germline Icarus mutations are known to be inherited in an autosomal dominant manner with reduced penetrance, it's prudent to test our patients' asymptomatic sibling and parents. The results of this testing reveals the mutation was inherited from the mother. Her patient and dad do not have, or her sibling and dad do not have the mutation. Even though the mother is seemingly asymptomatic, she establishes follow-up with clinical immunology because previous studies have demonstrated um, age of onset in Icarus-related uh, disorders ranges from infancy to the sixth decade of life. <clears throat> the patient's mother, who's 30 years old, has a history of meningitis at age 12, requiring a one and a half month long hospital stay. She has no other history of frequent, severe, or unusual infections, no diagnosed autoimmune disease, and no previous hematologic malignancies. Notably, she had a recent colposcopy concerning for possible early malignant changes. Though the mom was adopted, she knows her birth family, who are from Puerto Rico. Her aunt passed away due to stage four breast cancer, and a cousin also passed away due to sarcoma. Otherwise, there's no family history of immune, immunodeficiency, frequent infections, unexplained deaths, or autoimmunity. So mom's immunophenotyping reveals mild neutropenia with an AMC of 1500, normal numbers of T cells, B cells, and NK cells, Normal B cell subsets, except slightly low plasma blasts, which again may correlate with hypogammaglobulinemia in some patients. Normal immunoglobulins, except absent IgE. And she has protective IgG responses to tetanus, 4 or 14 pneumococcal serotypes, and varicella. And she's not protected against Hib, diphtheria, or measles, despite likely adequate vaccination, though we don't have records. We decide to revaccinate mom and we'll retest her in four months. Going back to our index patient, we now have a seven-year-old female with treatment refractory ITP and autoimmune hepatitis, pre ALL and remission and asthma, eventually found to have a germline Icarus mutation and inherited from the mother, which is thought to be the underlying cause of her multiple immune dysregulation. So in addition to more detailed and accurate immunophenotyping, our patient does have multiple pending workups and treatments. Because of her chronic treatment refractory ITP, we decided to treat her with a rituximab, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody which antagonizes B-cell function. Though this approach may seem counterintuitive in a patient at risk for B-cell defects, the agent is often used in B-cell defects with autoimmunity with good response. And it's known to be efficacious as a same-line therapy in chronic treatment refractory ITP. The patient received her fourth dose and final round last week, so we're waiting to hear about her response. Notably, ours is only the second report of a patient with a heterozygous germline Icarus mutation receiving rituximab. The first report from a New England Journal article in 2016 reportedly had a good, uh, good platelet response. So our patient will also likely obtain a liver biopsy to confirm autoimmune hepatitis 
if her platelets respond well to rituximab. Now I'd like to briefly review the current literature on germline gross mutations and illustrate how our case adds to it. Starting with some background, uh, background Icarus we'll is just, a uh, Sorry, we will just yeah. pause for just a moment. Um, did anyone have any questions or comments about the case thus far? Or Sergio, did you have any points to make about the case so far? Going perfect, so we have a question. Let's listen to the question. Cynthia had a question, I guess. Oh, I'm, I, uh, for some reason, I don't see the question. If, um, I saw something popping up saying that somebody had a question. Cynthia, you want to type your question? Yeah, I can see this question added by Cynthia, but for some reason, yeah, I am not, not seeing it in up. my yep. chat. So I'm sorry about that, Cynthia. Not me either. Okay. All right. Um, so with that, then uh, we'll go on to uh, hearing a little bit more about Icaros. Daniel? Okay. Um, so now I'll review the current literature on germline Icaros mutations, and I'll illustrate how our case adds to it. So starting with a little background, Icaros is a transcription factor encoded by the Icaros family zinc uh, finger protein 1, or IKZF1 gene. It's crucial for hemato hematopoiesis and B cell development. And somatic as opposed to germline Icarus mutations have long been known to be associated with pre-B ALL, especially in patients who are Philadelphia chromosome positive. Interestingly, a 2018 paper in Cancer Cell reported germline coding Icarus variants in almost 1% of all pediatric pre-B cell ALL cases. Given this is the most common malignancy in infancy and childhood, this was certainly a notable finding. The, author, the authors did note that these variants were clustered outside of known functional domains where all previously reported variants had been localized. Many of these variants were not predicted to be damaging using in silico prediction tools. However, functional testing in vitro and in vivo revealed the majority had deleterious uh, effects on Icarus function, providing evidence that these germline alterations predisposed to leukemia and potentially influenced response to treatment. So other recent studies revealed that a subset of CVID patients have heterozygous germline mutations of Icarus. These, these patients reportedly suffer a progressive loss from immune and B cells caused by aberrant development of common lymphoid precursors. Total T cell numbers are normal, uh, but patients often have quantitative changes in T cell subsets. Clinical manifestations include recurrent bacterial infections, especially the respiratory tract, autoimmunity, and increased risk of B-cell leukemia. These mutations are inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and display incomplete penetrance. It's important to note that Icarus mutations may have higher Im immunological penetrance versus clinical penetrance, meaning lab values may be abnormal in more patients earlier than patients present with symptoms of, immuni of immunodeficiency. So indeed, patients may present with symptoms later in life, even after the sixth decade and beyond. For this, reason, uh, for this reason, our patient and her mother could both still go on to develop progressive B-cell defects in the future, and both should be monitored. So although specific mutation, the specific mutation identified in our patient has been seen in three patients from a single family, ours is the first case of this mutation reported in a patient with multiple autoimmunity and pre-BLL. Also, ours is the first case in, of any heterozygous germline ingress mutation associated with autoimmune hepatitis. Including our case and our patient's mother, a total of 62 patients with germline heterozygous ingress mutations have been reported to date, and 19 families have been affected. Of the patients with mutations, 70% have clinical manifestations demonstrating incomplete penetrance. So there have been a number of reports now pre B A L L in association with germline Icarus mutations, demonstrating it's not just somatic Icarus mutations that predispose to hematologic malignancy. In the two largest case series, two of 38 patients developed pre B A L L. Additionally, the first cases of malignancies other than pre B A L L developing these patients were recently reported, with one patient developing T cell A L L, which has previously been seen in mouse models and another with a solid pseudopapillary pancreas tumor. 
So despite our patients' measurable immune abnormalities, one unique aspect to our case is the absence of B-cell abnormalities or clinical immune deficiency. Additionally, our patient tolerated chemo remarkably well with no complications of infections. Um, however, given previous reports of patients not presenting with symptoms until much later in life, she certainly needs to be monitored over time. Most of the 38 patients from the two largest case series displayed progressive declines in B-cells and immunoglobulins, as well as increased susceptibility to bacterial infections, but no predisposition to viral or fungal infection. Patients in these previous studies had normal peripheral T counts, but reverse CD4 or CD8 ratios. One paper recommended longitudinal follow-up as asymptomatic patients with these mutations using peripheral B cell numbers as a marker for disease progression. However, our case does demonstrate that B cell numbers can be normal even in patients already displaying other manifestations of immune dysregulation. So our patient's multiple autoimmunity is not surprising given pre previous reports of autoimmunity in these meat patients. However, ours is the first case of autoimmune hepatitis reported with any Icarus mutation. Ours is also the second report of the use of rituximab for autoimmune manifestations. And the New England uh, Journal article of 2016 reported one of their patients received four doses with a good platelet response. Autoimmunity has been previously reported in about 20% of cases with ITP being the most frequently reported. One previous study recommended that given the high incidence of immunodeficiency in association with ITP, all ITP patients should have immunoglobulin levels measured as part of the initial workup, even in the absence of infection. So this is a very similar recommendation to the French PID registry group recommendation discussed earlier. Other autoimmune manifestations include SLE, IgA vasculitis, JIA, juvenile myasthenia, reactive arthritis, and antiphospholipid syndrome. Including in our case, there have been 11 patients reported with autoimmune diseases and these mutations. An explanation for this higher occurrence of autoimmunity was recently proposed in one paper whose authors used lab modeling to demonstrate that patients may have hyper-responsive B cells and upregulated CD69 expression and downregulated CD22 expression at baseline, contributing to a lower uh, threshold for activation. Lastly, just wanted to touch on hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which seems to have been successfully used in other allelic variants of Icarus deficiency, specifically in patients with the newly reported dominant negative mutation of one amino acid. So rather than CVID, this mutation causes a profound combined amino deficiency. It was first reported in a 2018 JCI article in seven patients, all of whom exhibited infections characteristic of T cell deficiency, including PJP. Patients had both innate and adaptive immune defeat, uh, de defects, and most T, cell, T cells exhibited an, a naive phenotype and were unable to evolve into effector memory cells. Additionally, one patient developed T cell ALL. So in a new paper accepted to the Jackie, but currently in press, author, authors looked at outcomes of allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant in four patients with, with the same dominant negative Icarus mutation. Previous mouse models um, have suggested a significantly increased risk of GDHD and worse survival compared to mice uh, without this mutation. Encouragingly, the patients in this cohort did not display an unusually high rate of GDHD or death. Though this is a small cohort, it's reassuring to see that stem cell transplant may be a valid option for some patients with gross deficiencies and severe immune deficiency, as well as leukemia susceptibility. Obviously, further studies are needed on this. I'd like to conclude with our main clinical takeaway from this presentation. Um, so the co-occurrence of autoimmune disease and hematologic malignancies, with or without the presence of recurrent or frequent infections, particularly in very young patients, should prompt a workup for underlying genetic cause leading to primary immune deficiency. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that excellent presentation. Um, so th Cynthia um, had brought up a question. Uh, I don't know that there's going to be an answer, but um, you know, the question being, what would we do if the rituximab um, it is not effective in bringing up um, our patient's platelet counts? Um, does anyone have any thoughts as to other options? Um, I know we're just getting to the end of the hour here, but if there's any other input on what ideas for this, we'd be um, interested. Oh, bortezomib um, suggested. 
Um, do you have thoughts on that, Sergio? Uh, I think the bortezomib is a good idea. I will go directly to transplant. So transplant have proved to work. Even it was blinded, all the patients that were transplanted, they had a different mutation, but it worked pretty well, despite of what the mice model suggests before. So in a patient that already had one cancer, has autoimmunity against solid organs as, and also hematopoietic uh, uh, lineages, I think that if reduction doesn't work, I will start looking for donors because mm -hmm. I think that's in the future of this patient I'm in her best interest. So mm -hmm. just one more comment. So keep in mind that there are different phenotypes or different uh, mutations that can affect the gene eagers. So if you have one normal allele and nothing on the other one, you're gonna be haploid insufficiency and they will likely present like CBAD plus uh, uh, leukemia plus minus autoimmunity. But if you have the dominant negative mutation, you will present like a severe combined or combined immune deficiency. So they have the B cell component, but they have a very bad T cell compartment. Those patients certainly benefit from bone marrow transfer. And there are gonna be two papers coming up with two different phenotypes also associated with mutation in Icarus. One that is exactly the opposite of the dominant negative. So it's kind of uh, gain on function. And those patients present with a lot of allergy. And then we have another phenotype associated with dimerization defects that they have a lot of cancer. So there's more to come on the field of Icarus and is one gene, at least five different type of diseases. You have somatic mutations. There's a predictor factor for the outcome of BALL. And then you have at least four different germline type of mutations that give you four different clinical phenotypes. So the good times of one gene, one protein, one phenotype, guys, is over. So now we have one gene, multiple transcripts, multiple disorders, and multiple potential outcomes. And on top of that, incomplete penetrance of variable expressivity. So the good old times are over. Think about one gene, multiple diseases now. Thank you. Um, did we have any other comments um, or questions from the audience or from you, Sergio? Oh, that was a great presentation. Let's see if the group has any questions. All right. Well, so, I guess. And, yeah. mm -hmm. So no, just to complete Nicole uh, and Nicola uh, uh, suggestion. So keep in mind that it's interesting. Those patients, because they have usually progressive B cell disorders, so sometimes they do have uh, uh, plasma cells that they can be treated with bortezomib. So uh, in this case, because the patient has B cells, it's very likely that, uh, that she also has uh, plasma cells or bortezomib might work, but I will go, I will prefer or privilege bone marrow transplant over another biological in her case. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much. We're getting to the end of the hour here. And thanks for tuning in. Um, hope everyone has a good night. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Great, great, great job, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.